Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our special lecture here today in Covey. I'm Debbie Ingalls. I'm the director of the Institute here. Uh, we're always excited to be sharing research on uh, really important issues for our industry. Uh, and today, with the support of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, we're able to have this special lecture um, uh, in addition to our regularly scheduled Wednesday uh, uh, lecture. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a bit of a sore throat. So today I'm pleased to introduce to you uh, Dr. Sudarsaran Sana uh, Pujari of the AAFC Summerland Research and Development Centre in the Okanagan in British Columbia. And he'll be presenting an overview uh, for us today on diagnostics used in grapevine virus detection in uh, grapevine material, as well as giving an overview of the pros and cons of the various uh, techniques. His uh, talk is co-authored today with Dr. Tom Lowry and Dr. Jose Ramon Urbe Torres, uh, also uh, scientists at the Ag Canada Research Centre in Summerlin. So Sud received his PhD in plant pathology from Washington State University in 2013. He's now working as a postdoctoral fellow at the Summerland Research and Development Center in the Okanagan. And his research is focused on biological and epidemiological aspects of grapevine virus diseases in British Columbia. And today he's here to share, share his experiences with us. So please uh, join me in welcoming Sid. Thank, thank you, Debbie, for the introduction. Uh, as I de Debbie mentioned, uh, uh, I'm also thankful to AFC, uh, also uh, Kobe and the team of uh, viticulture and Enology here to giving me an opportunity to discuss my research uh, on especially on grapevine viruses. Uh, as I see a lot of students here, uh, I'd uh, like to start with an engaging conversation. Uh, I want to ask a question. Uh, how many of you know what is a virus? Can you define it? <clears throat> you think virus is dangerous? <laughs> uh, well, see, uh, uh, you know, basically we define in a simple terms is like a virus is an obligate parasite. That means it needs a living cell to survive. Uh, that means, which means that we cannot spray any external uh, like a fungicide or bacterial sites that what we use to kill bacteria or fungi, we cannot do that with the virus uh, because it's uh, always inside and it needs a living host. So that makes us uh, limitations for so many things as in terms of management, in some, in terms of detection. So, uh, and also the second question is the composition of virus. So. Uh, Irrespective of either it's a human infecting virus or a plant infecting virus or an animal infecting virus, the composition stands almost same. So virus is basically composed of two components. Anybody? So it's just a protein uh, coat. Yeah, you know, Wendy. <laughs> yeah, protein coat. There you go. So they contain only genetic material in terms of DNA or RNA, but never both. And then they're surrounded by this protein coat. So which leaves us only options of, in terms of detection, either you go for protein-based detection or you go for a nucleic acid-based detection, which is DNA or RNA. As I said, they don't contain both DNA or RNA at the same time. So either you have DNA viruses or RNA viruses. So that brings us, uh, you know, the brief introduction uh, outline of my presentation is I'll be explaining a little bit on why we want to do virus diagnostics, especially plant virus diagnostics related to grapevine viruses, and what are the important viruses, what are the minor viruses or major viruses, and what type of options that we have in terms of detection, as I mentioned, the protein-based detections like ELISA and uh, nucleic acid-based detections like endpoint PCR, uh, which is a conventional PCR. And also there are uh, PCR methods that you can quantify the virus. Uh, there are different uh, approaches to that. Uh, one I will be discussing in this lecture is uh, cyber green based uh, quantitative PCR and also a, a new addition to this kind of quantification is the digital droplet PCR. 
And also, uh, the latest innovations as so keep on improving. Uh, we have, uh, we might have heard a lot about the next generation sequencing and uh, in recent years how it is developed over the years to various type of research and how it is utilized or it is uh, being adapted to de detecting grapevine viruses. I'll touch a little bit on that and uh, I'll talk about pros and cons of these different techniques uh, in terms of uh, sample size that we have or what type of research we are doing. So with that, uh, let's answer the first question, why? Because it's very important to know why. Um, so the cause of the symptoms, uh, we, first thing we need to know if in terms of grapevine viruses, if I go into a vineyard, I see different type of symptoms. I wanted to know why, what it is. Either it is a, uh, a different pathogen like a, a phytoplasma or a fungi or bacteria or some insect related or some nutritional deficiencies. So that's the first question that will come to my mind, so what it is. So, and also um, these viruses, they cause different, they are different in terms of uh, their genetic material, that in terms of how they have been transmitted. So they do cause a different type of symptoms. For example, uh, they cause the common symptoms that we see on uh, uh, grape wines or leaf rolls or fan leaf or mosaic type or sometimes necrosis or chlorosis or the plant even uh, looks uh, stunting or some deformation on the fruits or on the leaves. So this type of uh, symptoms you see and then you ask either it is a single virus or multiple virus infections because in grape wines, uh, grape wine is one of the most susceptible crop species for virus infections. So there have been uh, reports that more than 70 different virus species uh, that can infect grape wines. Uh, and then uh, when we talk to growers, the first thing they ask for any type of pathogen or any type of problems due to a, a pathogen surface, that what can they spray? So how does that relate to virus infections? So because uh, some of these viruses are transmitted by insect vector, so that's what we call the secondary spread uh, of these uh, virus diseases. Of course, most of these uh, viruses, the primary spread being uh, through planting material. As you all know, probably the grape wines are propagated through planting material, and these viruses are mostly phloem limited and they present in the uh, plants cells. When you do uh, grafting or you propagate it, propagate from wine to wine, that's the primary mode of transmission. And that's where you see same type of viruses throughout the different uh, grape growing regions of the world because we interchange uh, planting material. And then you might be asking questions like, where is the source coming from? Uh, as I said, the planting material is one, whether it is seed transmitted or it is pollen transmitted or it is insect transmitted. Or is there any alternative host? Is there some of these viruses have their alternative host? Uh, for example, other than grapes that are commonly found in the vineyard, for example. If they are harboring these uh, viruses so that the insects get feed on them and get transmitted, and what, that's what also we call the secondary transmission. So to answer all these questions, uh, is there insect vectors involved? Or these vectors sometimes are mechanically transmissible? or there is, a, is there any other mode of transmission? So to answer all these questions, you know, diagnosis is very crucial. And in terms of you know, research, if you want to understand a disease pattern, or you want to monitor a disease spread, or you want to study how the disease is progressing uh, in particular region, for example. So to, all this, to answer all these questions, uh, diagnostic is the first step. Uh, do you want to know what the virus is, how it is, uh, what is the biology of the virus, disease. In terms of breeding, although uh, we have a very limited uh, information on uh, resistant to grapevine cultivars that are uh, resistant to viruses, uh, but yeah, this is one of the aspects that you need to diagnostic techniques uh, to, to see, uh, you can use it for resistance, uh, a resistance screening of these viruses. And then uh, one other critically important aspect is the plant protection quarantine. Uh, in, the, in the countries like the United States, for example, they have a strong foundation for a clean planet for program. Uh, 
that's what uh, you know, even in Canada we are trying to develop. Uh, it's in the, in the initial stages of getting going, uh, but uh, diagnosis is very critical to have something uh, a clean plan network program platform uh, to make sure that we have a supply of virus free plant, uh, planting material to growers because the industry is expanding. <coughs> and also in terms of quarantine, the regional and national pest regulatory program certification, for example, like uh, CFIA is very active uh, in terms of you know controlling this <coughs> viruses coming into the country, for example, <coughs> excuse me. They have a regulatory viruses, they have regulations on certain type of viruses that we don't have here. So diagnostics is very important uh, to keep them checked to entering into the uh, country. And also uh, uh, research like uh, the final product, like wine, how it is, or wine performance, or uh, uh, the wine growth, how the viruses are affecting uh, uh, these uh, aspects so that the you know, growers have a uh, first hand information on how the cultural practice are being practiced or how the uh, how we make a better quality wine uh, these kind of uh, aspects are very important uh, for the grape wine research and that's why um, plant wine uh, grape wine diagnostics is very crucial uh, to develop uh, a good platform or to tangulate and validate uh, this important techniques to detect the viruses. So with that, uh, with the latest information coming from uh, uh, Canadian Winery Associations, uh, I think Barack also having a, a contribution to this, uh, you see the one, uh, our industry is expanding. Uh, we are uh, both from Ontario, followed by British Columbia and Quebec and Nova Scotia, they've been contributing and it's been a, a huge difference. If you see uh, from last study to this study, we have around 33% 33 33 increase uh, on, on economy. Um, that almost close to 9 billion now. So with, th with that, uh, creating a lot of jobs and a lot of as in, in different aspects, the industry is mostly focused on high quality wine, along with wine tourism. And as you all know, the climate change predictions are also favoring Canadian wine grape to growing regions. So with that, everything brings to the sustainability because the growers we talk to every day and they, uh, the associations are interested in sustainable and probably uh, going towards the organic production system. So whenever we talk about any sustainable crop industry, uh, we talk about pathogens. Uh, pathogens and diseases are very important uh, and having research basic knowledge uh, is crucial to maintain the sustainability of cropping systems. So today, uh, as we all know, the focus on uh, grape viruses, as I mentioned, there are many, and I'm not kidding. Um, there are many. So, and it's very important to know which are important. Although there are different viruses that infect grapes, uh, we have seen, based on the research, uh, being done uh, throughout the different growing, grape growing regions from different uh, researchers, we know that there are certain group of viruses that are uh, more lethal or uh, cause more damage to the crop as well as crop production than the others. So, and how they do, how they, how they do that? Uh, they, they do cause production issues, uh, both in nurseries to, and also the vineyards. And on, on May, if you talk generally, uh, they do affect the rooting ability, some of these viruses, and they do affect the graft intake, as well as rootstock and cyan combinations. And the wine performance, overall wine vigor will be lower. And then yield and fruit quality, there are studies that uh, shows that uh, with the dollar numbers um, that they, the viruses like grapevine leaf roll disease or grapevine red blotch disease have a significant reduction uh, in yield and fruit qualities. So when you look at the major ones, uh, you're looking, up, looking at the grapevine leaf roll disease, which is, uh, of course, widely distributed uh, or widely uh, prevalent disease across all grape growing regions of the world. Uh, and then we have a uh, complex like rugose wood complex, which is uh, caused by uh, a number of viruses, uh, for example, rupestris trumpeting associated virus, 
and also some of the VT viruses like uh, grapevine virus A, B, and D. And also we have a grapevine uh, fan leaf degeneration complex, uh, which is uh, caused by grapevine fan leaf virus, which is uh, transmitted by nematode. And, and, then, and then the recently reported uh, um, grapevine red blotch virus. So uh, we will see how, uh, I have a few slides on how they uh, look like and you know, how can we can differentiate the symptoms based in the field conditions and how different they are. As I said, they're different. Uh, for example, I have here on the uh, left side uh, uh, a phylogenetic tree that are um, made with the full length genomes of different uh, viruses that belong to four different genus. And they are different, as you can see, based on the genome composition. Uh, there have been uh, most of these uh, grapevine leaf roll viruses belong to the genus Ampelovirus. Uh, as you can see, grapevine leaf roll one, uh, which are highlighted in red, uh, and one five and uh, strains of four uh, and leaf roll three are uh, belongs to Ampelovirus, and the leaf roll virus two belongs to the Clastrovirus. And uh, sometimes, and the leaf roll seven, of course, belongs to the Valeri virus. Then, most of the times, this classification also depend on the type of insect vectors they've been transmitted with. For example, most of these ampelloviruses are known to be transmitted by uh, either mealybug or scale insect species. And we don't have uh, any evidence of transmitting leaf, uh, grapevine leaf roll associated virus too uh, with any type of insect vector. Uh, so that kind of information that we have based on different uh, uh, virus species. Uh, in terms of grapevine red blot virus, the new virus uh, that's been recently uh, assigned a uh, genus, uh, glabrovirus, uh, belongs to the family Geminiviridae. It's a different virus because, uh, for example, all these uh, leaf roll viruses, the genetic material is RNA. And in, in, whereas uh, for red blot virus, the genetic material is DNA. And they do show different type of symptoms. Um, as you can see, these are uh, the pictures of classical leaf roll disease on a red-fruited cultivar. Uh, on the top, you can see Cabinet Frank. On the bottom, it's a mellow. Um, as you can see, the symptoms starts from the edges. Uh, these are called uh, intervenal reddening, uh, starting from the edges and slowly move towards the center of the leaf, and they coalesce. And, uh, forms this inter intervenal reddening of the leaf. And uh, these symptoms usually they start uh, after the variation, which is the color change of the fruit. Uh, and then as the season progresses, as you see uh, on the bottom figures here, the edges of the leaves roll back, and that's why we call leaf roll virus. And if you have a severely infected virus, you can see a range of symptoms like this on a whole um, vine, as you can see here. But at the beginning stage, at the early stages of these symptoms, these symptoms are only um, limited to the mature leaves, uh, which are close to the cordons or, uh, or the trunk. That's one of the aspects that we'll be seeing uh, uh, in the fields. And in whites, yeah, they do show different symptoms because obviously we don't have anthocyanins in whites. So uh, the symptoms on the left hand here is the one that I have in the greenhouse. They do show uh, typically different symptoms in the greenhouse when you compare to uh, the ones that we see in the uh, vineyards in the natural conditions, of course. Uh, as you can see here, the leaf uh, definitely showing the rolling back of the edges. And in the field conditions, you might see also a chlorosis, uh, as you can see here. Uh, and some of these leaves, most of these leaves are rolled back. Uh, that's the typical symptoms of leaf roll disease. And what's the difference in terms of uh, uh, leaf roll and red blotch? I would say they actually look very similar in terms of disease. Uh, the only difference that we see is uh, the rolling back of the leaves doesn't happen in, t in case of grapevine red blotch virus. Uh, but what you do is or see that in the uh, leaf roll virus. As you can see, the virus particles structures here, they are flexuous rods, uh, but we still uh, haven't have uh, a virus morphology of a grapevine red blotch virus. 
uh, we are trying. Uh, we have not we have we're successfully unsuccessful with that. And uh, the genetic material, as I said, um, the RNA for grapevine leaf roll and the DNA for red blotch. And you see the genome organization. These clusteroviruses are known to be one of the longest uh, genome in terms of geno uh, genome size. Uh, plant viruses known so far, as you can see, the genome of leaf roll three there uh, with uh, close to or more than 19,000 uh, base pairs. Whereas uh, grapevine red blotch virus, on the other hand, it's a DNA virus, it's very short, uh, 3,200 base pairs, and it is circular when you compare to the uh, linear genome or linear genome of the RNA. So those kind of basic differences that you see in terms of genome. But I want to put this picture again, which is my initial slide, uh, to show the difference between the you know, different viruses that we talk in the literature. We see how uh, we can differentiate between the leaf roll and red blotch, uh, especially early symptoms. This is a Merlot uh, that I took last year. As you can see, uh, the leaf in the fourth background here, this is a blotchy. Uh, I would say, based on my experience, maybe it's a red blotch virus, but the, next, the leaf next to it, uh, it's very typical of the leaf roll virus. I went, I took this both leaves, went to the lab and did the testing, and it both came out to be a leaf roll, uh, grapevine leaf roll associated virus 3. So, the point I'm getting here is the symptoms <laughs> at the early stages, they are, uh, they both are, they both mimics. It's hard to differentiate. Uh, definitely, uh, diagnostics <coughs> is crucial in terms of you know differentiating what is what. Uh, and during my PhD, uh, I had a project to work on on a, a cultivar called San Juvise, which is infected with the grapevine leaf roll associated two, but it doesn't show any symptoms. It stays, it stays latent, what we call it in scientific term. Um, but it has an uh, uh, effect on the wine performance as well as you know, the, the quality of the, wine, the, the grapes. So um, what I'm trying to say is here, uh, depending on visual symptoms, uh, it's not a good way to go forward with, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, saying how healthy your wines are. Uh, that's, that plays a very important role in terms of, you know, uh, if you are looking at a large scale diagnostics, uh, if, you go, if you go based on the symptoms, uh, it might be tricky sometimes. So what are options we have? Um, as I said, um, uh, virus can be diagnosed based on in the laboratory conditions. You can have a, a serological um, based techniques or molecular based techniques, which is again protein and nucleic acid based techniques. And uh, another aspect that I forgot to mention is uh, the morphology. You can see the virus. Viruses are very small. You can't see with the naked eye, but uh, if you have access to electron microscope, yes, you can see the uh, virus. That's another way of detecting the virus, uh, but it's also uh, uh, highly technical uh, abilities are needed and uh, equipments are needed uh, for that. So I won't be talking on electron microscopy today, uh, but. Uh, in the field conditions, as you can see in the, on the left side, uh, we can also detect virus based on the biological indexing, what we call, uh, as, as you can see on the picture here, if you have a rootstock that is infected or a cion that is infected, and if you take an alternatively a healthy uh, rootstock or cion combinations, you can actually transmit the virus because most of these viruses, as I said, they are present in the uh, planting material. And if you can repeat the symptom, you can uh, observe the symptoms. That means virus is, is transmitting from uh, uh, from primary source to secondary source. Uh, that's one way of doing uh, virus detection. But uh, as you can see, it, it is. Uh, indicator of the disease it's not uh, but it uh, you can be highly confident in what you are doing because you can say it's a pathogen definitely but if you know that you are working with a virus uh, and also it is sometimes it's time consuming you know how the grapes are grown and you can also use some of the indicator plants for some of the viruses not all of them uh, to see if they can uh, produce a different type of symptoms on other plants that's where you can know what type of virus it is so, uh, 
Coming back to the laboratory-based diagnostics, uh, as you can see, I mentioned here is the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, which is protein-based. And I have a few slides based on uh, the ELISA, what is the advantage and disadvantages. I just want to mention here what type of uh, options that we have on molecular side as well. As you can see, the polymerase chain reaction is a conventional PCR reaction and be referring it as a PCR from now onwards. And reverse transcription PCR, don't be confused, reverse transcription for real-time PCR. Sometimes, you know, so if you don't know about this ter terminology, it's easy to get confused. Uh, reverse transcription PCR are used because most of, as I mentioned, most of these viruses are RNA as a genetic material. So you want to convert that into cDNA first, that's what reverse transcription, and then do the PCR. And then we have quantitative PCRs, uh, and droplet digital PCRs, and then I will be talking about some next generation sequencing as well. So let's get on to uh, LSA first. As, I, as mentioned, for accurate diagnostics is important for management of the virus diseases. So LSA, um, or enzyme linked immunosorbent assay, as I mentioned, it's a protein base. Uh, we have both, you can develop antibodies for any protein uh, by injecting to a certain animal and then take those antibodies to uh, again detect antigens from your virus. That's a, a basic principle behind it, but I'm not going to, you know, the principles or how the methodology is, but let's talk about the uh, advantages and disadvantages of it. Of course, LSS are used for large scale detection because it needs very really less technical knowledge, um, and it can be uh, used for large-scale detections. But if you see the limitations of it, uh, the antibodies availability uh, for different grapevine viruses are limited. Uh, as you can see, I, I listed a few viruses here that can infect grapevines. Um, as you can see, for example, grapevine red blotch virus, which is a new virus, we don't have antibody available yet. So it makes a little limitation in terms of, you know, what is the range of viruses that we can detect. Of course, it's all based on the needs that growers or the researchers have. Uh, uh, and also, um, time consuming. Uh, it takes a couple of days based on the type of LSA that you are doing. Of course, we have different type of LSA. Again, the direct LSA, indirect LSA, based on the number of, uh, they're all very, very, in terms of number of steps that you are doing. And sometimes uh, these antibodies can produce some non-specific reactions. And uh, you need to be investing a lot to, uh, to develop the antibodies first. And when you are looking at the commercial point, you need to be balanced where your needs are and uh, whether it meets your production or investment on production. That's one of the big concerns. And probably that's one of the reasons why you don't have antibodies available for all the viruses that you see. And also, the quality of the antibodies, you need to be spending a lot of time and money and effort uh, to make a quali uh, highly purified or very specific antibodies. Uh, and also, uh, these viruses, they tend to, tend to vary in terms of, because uh, especially RNA viruses in natural conditions because of the disease pressure uh, and and the crop pressure, they tend to go a recombination, natural recombination, and produce variants. And uh, that's one of the reasons that you may end up uh, not detecting a particular virus because maybe it has mutated. And uh, those kind of limitations that we see in terms of uh, uh, LSA based detection techniques. So let's move on to the PCR. So I want to just focus on one of the, um, uh, well, I'm not talking about, you know, basic principle of the PCR and how it works, but uh, I would talk about uh, a PCR diagnostic te technique that we uh, adapted from Rohani et al., uh, especially the extraction process, uh, where we uh, don't use any commercial kit, which is one of the uh, cost uh, limiting factor for many large scale diagnostics. So we developed this, uh, we adapted this uh, uh, technique uh, which uses a three-step protocol to isolate total nucleic acid. So which is, uh, I'm not going to the details of it, but it only takes 
uh, 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 10 minutes for preparing a sample, for example. So it's very rapid, sensitive, and also at the same time cost effective. As I mentioned, we don't need to go for a, a high end uh, RNA isolation or DNA isolation. And another advantage of this is it isolates the total nucleic acid, which again favors if you want to. Uh, use the same genetic material, the same uh, sample prep for detecting DNA viruses as well as RNA viruses. So we use this technique and then we do the PCR using virus specific primers and then we run on uh, uh, digital electrophoresis from KIGN and that's typically how our gels looks like uh, for different viruses. So um, I just wanted to focus all these studies with a case study. Um, for this particular uh, technique that we used uh, during the last two years of our surveys in uh, British Columbia vineyards, uh, Columbia vineyards, uh, we used this technique to uh, uh, study both leaf roll viruses and red blotch uh, virus. First, I will focus on the leaf roll virus. Uh, as you can see, the sampling, uh, sampling process on the left side, as I mentioned, uh, for this study is a uh, um, uh, we, we followed a four into five quadrant sampling strategy adapted from Mark Fuch et al. Uh, and then we did a random uh, composite sampling. So I mean, what, when I mean a composite sample, it typically have four leaves for wine from five consecutive wines. And that's on the top, you can see the, the vineyard, uh, the, the sampling process of the vineyard. And this, uh, for this survey, we haven't, uh, given any priority of the symptoms because we wanted to know what's the uh, situation, what's how, how, how healthy they are at their natural stage. Uh, and then we know that these viruses or uh, grape wine leaf roll viruses are uh, unevenly distributed and um, they're, sometimes they're in low concentration. So we, uh, we take uh, every sampling strategy again, I want to emphasize this is very crucial if you want to detect a virus. Uh, so we take each uh, four leaves, uh, as, as I mentioned in this uh, figure here, one, two, three, four, from, or two from each direction and covering the both sides so that we can cover the entire canopy. Uh, sometimes these viruses are, you know, as I mentioned, they are unevenly distributed. So with this, we targeted about 128 commercial vineyards for this particular study. As you can see, the number of samples here and the bottom and the number of blocks here. And I just divided just for the ease of uh, understanding uh, of all these samples based on the year of planting. Uh, we can detect the viruses or we can detect this many number of viruses and then uh, have an idea of what is the percentage of virus incidence based on uh, uh, age or based on the uh, region of the uh, um, of the wine growing region. Uh, so we have different options now and we know how to focus. So those are some of the advantages uh, that uh, can be done with these large scale diagnostics. So similarly, um, for grape wine red blotch disease, uh, we use the same uh, leaf petioles for either total, or total nucleic acid extraction or DNA extraction. And we use two sets of primers to the PCR two sets of primers as I shown it here. Uh, I run the gel and see uh, what's the, uh, whether the virus is there or not. So I uh, just want to show the table with the results here. We, in 2014, for example, I divided this results based on the year uh, so that you know, we, can, uh, we can understand how uh, the virus is spreading, uh, maybe what is the sources are from, uh, to answer those type of questions. In 2014, as I mentioned, we targeted 52 vineyard blocks uh, as uh, composing of 525 random composite samples. As I mentioned, this is, this is a composite sample, so each sample represents at least uh, five different wines. That means the 525 will probably represent around 2,600 wines. So we did the PCR-based diagnostics. And uh, what we found, as you can see here, as I highlighted in red, out of uh, uh, 525 samples, we only found in three samples. So that got us uh, thinking about the age of the vineyards. Uh, so then we figure out that all of our uh, samples are uh, more than 10 years old. So in 2015, for example, we targeted 
angle web blocks, we did a uh, much larger number of samples, uh, 76 vineyard blocks, and probably wines are aged between two and eight years. Uh, of the four, uh, 1,475 random composite samples, as you can see, we found uh, 29 uh, in five different blocks. Uh, that, again, gives us an idea of where we are in terms of this new red blotch virus in uh, uh, British Columbia. Uh, that also gives us more options on thinking about how, the, how, to, how we have to move forward with the management or you know, work on those particular blocks and see if there is any secondary spread going on, is there any vector involved, uh, those kind of things. So with that, um, I'll move forward with the quantitative uh, PCR detection options. Uh, this is the work that we had done at uh, Washington State University. It's one of my PhD uh, thesis objectives to uh, uh, see if we can differentiate, uh, detect as well as differentiate different grapevine viruses. Uh, this is an approach that uh, is in this slide where uh, we work with the plant or insect tissue, uh, especially mealybugs or scale insects, uh, because these viruses, as mentioned, are transmitted by uh, this species of uh, insects. And we isolate the nucleic acids, either total RNA from plant tissue or total nucleic acids from insect tissue. Uh, of course, uh, you know, each step, each, uh, each PCR method is different. Uh, as you go on with the more sensitive, obviously you have more steps to follow and which also adds up to your cost. And uh, for this, uh, after, adding, after extracting total nucleic acids, you need to go for a cDNA preparation. Uh, we usually did it with the random hexomer so that we can use the same template to detect multiple viruses. Uh, and uh, we designed primers uh, for virus specific primers. And we also did a single plex, which can mean that it can detect only one virus, and a duplex PCR mix of two different sets of primers and see if we can differentiate two viruses. And as you mentioned, you, as you all might know that the cyber green based is a fluorescence based detection assay. It's not a probe based detection assay. Again, I'm not discussing the methodology and principle of it. Um, I leave that to students. Uh, and uh, the advantage of it is uh, if you use this um, cyber green assay, you can differentiate uh, different uh, viruses based on the melt curve uh, analysis. So uh, going forward, these are the primer sets that we designed uh, and used for both single plus and uh, duplex uh, RT-QPCR options. So of course, you need to standardize. One of the um, limitations of uh, cyber green or um, fluorescence based assays is you always want to have a reference gene or uh, a, a known gene that is uh, a, a, a plasmid, for example. So we had to standardize and see how efficiently our primers are. So we did that uh, for all the viruses, for example, if all one, two, three, and four, and grapevine red blotch virus, and a couple of VT viruses, GBA and GBB, as well as grapevine fan leaf virus, and tomato ring spot virus, because we know that these are the viruses uh, based on our uh, field surveys that we found in Washington State at the time. So uh, based on the uh, CT values, uh, we know that we can calculate and we can differentiate between these two, uh, uh, between, between the viruses. As you can see, uh, you can also calculate the virus copy numbers based on this. You can compare uh, your uh, field samples uh, data with the reference uh, uh, genes or uh, uh, plasma number copies, and then you can uh, calculate the copy numbers of it. And if you see the single plex and duplex analysis here, I just wanted to mention here is the average melting temperatures that you wanted to see here. So we made sure that we tried with the different primers and we made sure that we have primers that can at least differentiate each virus by two degrees centigrade. So that's how you can differentiate based on your melt curve, as you can see in the next slide. So that's how you differentiate based on the melting temperatures uh, uh, of two different viruses. We, we tried more than two, but uh, there was issues. Uh, but if you, uh, with these methods, with these particular primers, uh, we can able to standardize a, a, a duplex RT-PCR, RT-QPCR assay uh, for uh, 
six different or sorry five different combinations of viruses. Especially, it is useful when you have leaf oil three and uh, red blotch and in the same assay because those are the viruses that are uh, widely distributed nowadays. Uh, so that's uh, one of the advantage. And we also validated this technique with a uh, lot of field samples as well as some of the insects for leaf rolls. As you can see here, uh, the sensitivity uh, are quite uh, different in terms of, you know, uh, when you compare to endpoint, which is conventional PCR or RT-PCR, uh, there are more we can detect with this duplex because of the sensitivity of the assay. And uh, although we didn't find any such differences in terms of, uh, especially for uh, red blot, uh, we, did, uh, we did find it for leaf rolls. Uh, and also we could able to detect if, uh, because as I mentioned, the, leaf, the mixed infections are very common, uh, we could able to detect the mixed infections uh, for the field samples. So um, let's move on to the next one, which is a droplet digital PCR. Again, I'm not going to the meteorology, uh, how, uh, how it works, but uh, this is the uh, method that we recently developed for both red blotch and leaf roll viruses. Uh, to see and quantify the virus, uh, the difference between the fluorescence and droplet digital PCRs is uh, in droplet digital PCRs, as the name says, it's a digital and it's a absolute quantification. You don't need to that means uh, you don't need to go to a, a reference gene and say and compare and how much of your gene of interest to the reference gene. Instead, you can uh, you can absolutely quantify the uh, virus uh, in a single reaction. So uh, this is the uh, gel picture, uh, sorry, graphic that will tell you that's the rain of droplets. That's how the results are uh, analyzed. And you can see the dilute copies I uh, just mentioned here and the template concentration that I, I have uh, a, a series of diluted plasmid uh, that we made and see if you have uh, tenfold dilutions, how consistent it is uh, in terms of uh, uh, getting your copy numbers. Uh, it's almost tenfold uh, less uh, as you go on to the next level of dilution. So that's how sensitive it is. And uh, we are using this kind of techniques to uh, see if there is any uh, time of the season, for example, for red blot wires, uh, uh, what time of the season is uh, good for uh, going for a diagnostic X-ray that will give more answers to the growers and uh, to uh, which time of the year is suitable or which part of the plant is suitable uh, for virus detection. So to put everything together, uh, to summarize, uh, conventional PCR, real-time PCR, and digital PCR, uh, the detection, yes, you can do detection with all the methods, depending on your needs. Uh, and the quantitative, uh, quant quantitativeness is relative in real, uh, if you are using a fluorescence-based uh, uh, real-time PCR assay, and digital PCR is, of course, absolute. Uh, but the advantages and disadvantages or limitations, if you're uh, talking about uh, the conventional PCR, of course, it is sophisticated, and uh, in terms of uh, time limitations, it take it can take uh, hours. Um, uh, based, uh, I mean, I'm not talking about the uh, initial extraction part of nucleic acids, but in your processing after your nucleic acids, definitely PCR will take a few hours. Uh, because you have to go, there is a uh, post-PCR processing that after you do PCR, you have to run a gel and to see if there is a S or no answer. And uh, these are size-based answers. It won't give you how many numbers of copies of a particular viruses. And then that's completely different in terms of real-time and digital PCR. As, you can, as I already mentioned, you can detect the virus and you can quantify the virus. And uh, one of the limitations uh, uh, with the both digital and droplet is how, uh, how far you can go for large scale uh, detection. If you have so many samples, uh, it becomes quite tedious and also exp expensive uh, and also needs a lot of uh, optimization uh, for particular virus that you are working on. Uh, and of course, as the number of steps increases in molecular biology, you are increasing the number of, uh, you are increasing the cost of the process, uh, and, uh, and the technicality of the pro uh, process. Uh, if you want to do a multiplex, yeah, definitely uh, you need uh, skills and knowledge of that uh, uh, particular techniques. 
So uh, with that, um, let's go back. Uh, let's go to uh, our next detection or diagnostic method, which is a, a newly uh, new in the market, next generation sequencing. And I, in this slide, I just put a few points where uh, typically, if you want to uh, develop a wireless detection program using NGS, what are the steps to follow? Uh, so as you can see. Um, the virus, uh, you need a planting material, and definitely you are going to work with the nucleic acids. There are different methods that to, to, to do that. Either you go for total, total RNA, or total DNA, if it is a DNA virus, or uh, you go for small RNAs, the micro RNAs or small interfering RNAs, uh, or you can go for a double standard RNA. Uh, why you double standard RNA? Because probably you know the rest of them. Uh, the double standard RNA is an intermediate form of replication for all the, either it's a plant virus or animal virus. So that's one of the um, steps that you can catch or isolate the DS double standard form of RNA, and then you subject that to your next generation sequencing to characterize or detect the virus. And of course, uh, um, the quality checks are very important if you are going for such a high sensitive uh, techniques. Uh, you need to be make sure that you were either DSRNA or the total RNA or DNA or small RNAs or the qualities are uh, good. Uh, and also, you have to probably uh, go, and go for an enrichment of viral nucleic acid, uh, which again depends whether you want to do it with a set of primers or uh, like a random exomers or an adapters using adapters, or you can reduce the or depletion of the host genetic material. For example, you can do a ribodepletion to uh, get rid of the host ribosomal RNA so that your viral concentrations RNAs are enriched. So, and then you have, the next step is the library preparation. You need to make a cDNA library and then go for uh, PCR reactions and then you put those samples on the NGS platform. Then you get large amount of data. Uh, usually it's MBs. Uh, or GBs, uh, the quality check for, again, if you want to read those sequences, you have to have a facility, like a bioinformatic facility, uh, where you need to go for a quality uh, check first, uh, for example, removing, removing those adapters that you use, and also uh, the, for the assembly program, there are so many uh, assembly pro programs for Dino assembly of sequence rates. And, and after that, you know that what you have got, and then you go for analysis. Like either you go for a, a, a gene banks where you can do a blast of your uh, sequences, or you can develop your own protocol where you can uh, have your own virus database and blast against those. Uh, and then finally comes to your uh, purpose. Either you want to diagnose the virus or discover a new virus. So um, I'll tell I'll tell a little bit about that in a few, a few slides later. Um, a case study. So it's like you know one of my PhD project to look into a, a, a one of the aspects where we found uh, leaf roll like symptoms, and then uh, we could not find any leaf roll viruses in it. So we we try to uh, approach for this uh, uh, NGS technology to see if we can find anything uh, any virus in it. Uh, so we did uh, same ribodepletion as well as uh, poly A depletion uh, to get rid of uh, poly A tied RNAs, well, for ribodepletion to get rid of the right ribosomal RNAs. So uh, taking total RNA, of course, as a uh, as a starting material, we made cDNA libraries and uh, we used the uh, Illumina genome analyzer well, two x at the time uh, and. And what we got from the sequence reads, uh, we mapped first all these reads to Whitey's Vinifera genome because, uh, thanks to uh, researchers, we know we now have a Whitey's Vinifera genome. Um, so that way, you can eliminate uh, all the genes that are matched to the host, and then you all ended up end up with either Whitey's viroid or some other non-specific sequences. And based on those, we can uh, go for a de novo assembly uh, and see what viruses we have, or, or go for a blast and see what viruses we have, or we can analyze them. So, as I mentioned, we did uh, symptoms and uh, non symptoms. Uh, the, the sensitivity of this assay is it can pull so many things. So, as you see here in our case, 
we found uh, both uh, in terms of viruses, we found Grapevine red blotch virus, a fan leaf virus, and another uh, virus, Rupestris tempting associate virus. Uh, in, the, in the leaves from uh, symptomatic, uh, sorry, the plants that are collected from, uh, that are showing symptoms, sorry. And in terms of uh, the plants that are not showing symptoms, we still did find a virus, uh, which is a robust stem pitting as well as the virus, which is very common in grapes. Uh, but uh, in conventional PCRs, we could not be able to detect this virus, probably it's, it's in very low concentration. And we also found a few viroids in both symptoms and non-symptomatic uh, leaves. So um, I just put this figure to just differentiate based on the uh, you know, reads that we got. As you can see, uh, dual depletion, which is ribosomal depletion and poly-A depletion, actually got us a less number of reads. That means some of these viruses are also poly tailed and they, they probably we have eliminated during our process. So we uh, recommend uh, that the ribodepletion is one of the uh, ways to go forward if you want to detect uh, viruses uh, in grapes. So and also another advantage of doing NGS is in doing either conventional or PCR, you're only targeting a part of a gene of the virus. But it, in NGS, you can recover the complete genomes of the virus, which is um, very important if you want to do a phylogenetic analysis or how it is evolved, or you want to study different parts of the virus, or if you want to know what are the variants that are there. So it's very important. That that's one of the advantages of doing NGS is you get a lot of data with a lot of information and information on the complete genome of the viruses. So to put together, the, uh, compare, the comparing PCR and NGS, we already talked about the PCR. I'm not going to go through it again. Uh, but if you see the NGS, if definitely you are looking at the viral, which is <coughs> everything of virus related or viroids related that you can uh, characterize uh, at the same time. Uh, the advantage is definitely uh, you know, you're not depending on any housekeeping or, st or standard genes that may require in one of some of the PCR techniques. And you also require very less amount of template. That's so very sensitive and can detect multiple viruses. And as I said, you can, you can characterize genomes of different viruses at the same time. And the limitations of uh, talking about NGS, uh, well, it's still different laboratories are trying to develop this as diagnostic facilities. But in my view, we are still in the, in the pipeline. We are still in the process of doing that because still for large scale detection, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's still uh, 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 in terms of cost, in, in terms of uh, uh, technical knowledge or computational skill that you need, and the equipment you need, and uh, you know, ad adapting to a different or different protocols for different crop species or different viruses, whatever you're studying, and developing these pipelines, it's still con time consuming and uh, involves a lot of uh, investment. So, and of course, these are all based on your research needs. And uh, one thing is, um, if you see into the literature of next generation sequencing, how it is used, especially for grape viruses, you always find it is used mostly for discovery of the virus. You want to answer some particular uh, problem. Uh, or, so diagnostics, yeah, we're still working on it. So it's not, not there yet. So um, of course, if there any diagnostic method or any pathogens, we have challenges. Uh, so sampling methods, the virus, any detection methods, the, uh, the diagnosis, the di diagnosis begins in the field. Uh, so sampling methods need to be standardized and practiced, which are, which should be, uh, we should have uh, sensitivity, uh, you know, uh, repeatability and reproducibility. You know, make sure you're not contaminating uh, things. Uh, and also nucleic acids uh, extraction, library preparation methods need to be standardized uh, and you are working with uh, uh, you know, real-time PCRs or uh, next generation sequencing approaches. The bioinformatic pipelines should be very strong. And yes, uh, the speed, sensitivity, specificity, robustness and cost effectiveness, these are the things that we always uh, keep in mind when you are developing or using a diagnostic process. 
And uh, as I mentioned, this most of these grape wire, grapevine viruses are prime limited and occur in very low concentration and with uneven distribution. Uh, the diagnostics, yes, we need to take uh, uh, critical steps to address all these issues. I would like to uh, uh, finish the talk with uh, uh, a quote uh, from uh, Best in Natal in 2008, that molecular diagnostic test is a constant portioning of optimization of the reaction conditions as well as minimum degree of proficiency. So with that, um, I would like to acknowledge uh, the funding sources of, for the part of this uh, presentation actually uh, came from British uh, Columbia Wine Grape Council, <laughs> as well as AFC CAB and the AFC ABASH initiative programs. And also I would like to thank my supervisors, uh, Tom Lowry and Jose uh, Urbez Torres, as well as the viticulture team back Owen, uh, Carl and Kevin Isher. Uh, which are, who are very supportive for the entire program, and our collaborators, Anna Mary and uh, Mike Rod from CFIA, uh, Deborah and Wendy, and of course, thanks to the Debbie English for inviting me here to share the experience. And of course, I've, nothing have, would have been possible with, uh, uh, without the technical support as well as the uh, student support. Uh, they're, they're the one who did all the work. Uh, sometimes I just stay and look at them. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to me, and uh, I would take if there is any questions. <laughs> yes? I have a grower question. All right. Earlier in the slide, you mentioned about uh, rooting ability. Yes. I wonder if you could expand upon that a bit more, and then maybe comment on can be done on new planted vines for a couple of years? Yes. So what I mean by, uh, the question is on rooting ability. Um, what I mean by that is, uh, uh, I will share my experience. You know, we, start, we started a, a, a virus vineyard because of different regions, uh, different reasons. Um, if a, a plant is infected, uh, through a secondary infection, for example, it is in the vineyard, it's probably five, six year old, and it is uh, got infected with through uh, insects, uh, mealybugs or scales. W our understanding is it can withstand the virus for quite a few years. But uh, when we did this particular experiment where we have uh, a grafted or own rooted a virus infected plant and trying to establish that, and that particularly probably what happens in the nurseries, uh, we had a hard time in establishing those some of the wines. We have almost 20 to 30 percent uh, mortality rates. It, they could not make it to second year. That means uh, they have uh, issues with the rooting ability because, of, of course, obviously plant is stressed. Uh, and also, um, there are some viruses like grapevine stem pitting associated virus. Uh, they have this grafting incompatibilities you graft with the rootstock that is infected, the cyan probably healthy, uh, the incompa incompatibility, what it makes uh, probably uh, you know, gives more mortality than others. So, and your uh, next question uh, is on. Just on that note though, you said 20 to 30 percent mortality is what you expect. It could be more than that, yes. It could be more, sure, but <coughs> did the vine struggle when it was in the ground or did it just not catch? Uh, it, it did. We, we saw it struggle uh, a lot, and even once they were uh, making up, but still, you know, it's, they, when you compare to the healthy ones, they're still uh, the growth is not as good, uh, and also, you know, you can see the plant is uh, very sick, uh, and it definitely it shows symptoms. Yeah. The symptoms that we see uh, in the young wines are more severe than the ones that were on the established wines. Yeah, um, thank you very much, very uh, informative uh, lecture. I have a couple of um, technical questions uh, regarding the uh, DNA um, isolation. Right. Uh, you used the actually interesting I mean, technique that I think there's no any isolation involved, right. like grinding. It reminds me of I mean, a similar like, I mean, approach that uh, we used for complex virus right. uh, about 10 years ago that you just grind and then mix a little bit of buffer and then directly use them in a real-time PCR. 
Um, probably I missed, uh, I think you used that technique for the M20 PCR, but have you used the that technique for the real time PCR? Because when I look at the like, real time PCR, yes. there is a DNA isolation uh, section. So that's my first question. Right. And then um, second question is so you used imminent cyber uh, in a real time PCR. Uh, commonly, many people, uh, you already have been precisely in the comment of throwing cons right. with the cyber green. But also, timeline is very popular nowadays. Yes. And then I was wondering, particularly the uh, great real world different wires, there's a one, two, three, four. Right. It could be really even really handy if you can really design a multiple uh, multiplex and a timeline that can really detect all four wires at the same right. time. So, have you ever even considered uh, switching from the cyber to a timeline? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, to answer the first question, uh, the simple answer is no, <laughs> because obviously, you know, uh, when you want to do a cDNA uh, preparation for using for either real-time PCR or droplet digital PCR, you would need a high-quality uh, total RNA or you know, total uh, DNA, for example. So we haven't used uh, uh, the three-step protocol uh, to see how it works, but uh, for insects, for example, we did use it. Although we saw some, you know, limitations with in terms of detection, it could still work. But I would recommend that we need to have a high quality uh, nucleic acid if you want to go for uh, piece, uh, quantitative PCRs. Of course, it is same for the next generation sequencing as well. Uh, and uh, the second question, uh, uh, it's. It's it is uh, you know it's important you know use attachment probes uh, if you want to go for multiple but uh, I, we were mostly interested in you know limiting the cost at the time for that particular project and also see if you can do uh, use the cyber green obviously it is cheaper with the cyber green and uh, use that technique to do uh, go for a duplex assay using the melt curve. Uh, analysis. That's an advantage of using cyber green uh, when you do that. Uh, Tackman, yeah, of course, you need to. The price of uh, probe, making probes is a little on the far side than using cyber green. That's the only thing, but yeah, definitely that's one of the possibilities. Yes. yes. Uh, I'm surprised that you think that ELISA is going to be more time consuming than PCR. So I'm just wondering if you had really high affinity antibodies that were very specific, would you still think that that would be a better method? Well, it depends on your, your need. Yeah, definitely. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, for large scale detection, uh, you you are not in a, uh, in a verge of you know time. You know, there is no. Uh, requirement that you need to have uh, results by this day. For example, in that cases, yeah, I would definitely use ELISAs. And uh, in terms of ELISAs, especially for clear point leaf roll viruses, we know that uh, for leaf roll three and other two or two, three different strains of leaf rolls, we have uh, a good antibody available. Uh, that's one of the options. Even one of some of our some of our detection techniques actually we use ELISAs, and then we. For confirmation of specific ones, if we have any uh, anything that is showing a weak positive or something we have sus uh, suspectful, then we go back to the PCR and see. Uh, and also uh, the same case with uh, uh, different strains of leaf rolls. Uh, when we know uh, that leaf, uh, where a weak positive is always, especially with the leaf roll four, uh, we have issues, and then we went to PCR and see which. Which strain of it is because in leaf roll four we have different strains. I think we have five or six different strains. Uh, we want to know which strain it is. Uh, we go back to PCR. So if you were just looking as a diagnostic for a grower community, maybe a live would be a more quick and dirty way to look at That's right. I would say yes. Except the cat for a bit one of the <clears throat> problems we've had working with the uh, Red Plane Red Block here in Ontario <clears throat> is basically the cost of doing the assets. Yes. Uh, typically in the work from $50 to $65 per sample. <clears throat> now, the, the Red Plane method that uh, Juan Chick mentioned a few minutes ago, where we basically use a, a direct 
plant extraction buffer. Yes. Uh, without doing the RNA extraction. Uh, it works well in some examples like Prunus or uh, Hose, where we have high virus concentrations. But when we start getting into flow and limited viruses at low concentration, and the presence of phenols and quinones and all kinds of other nasty uh, yes. <clears throat> host products, uh, we find that it doesn't work that well. So we end up going back to doing the, in this particular case, with the red blotch, the DNA right. extractions. Uh, <clears throat> Um, you mentioned a system by Mulvaney. Yes. There was a manuscript back in 2000 where he's using buffer A and buffer B. Yes. Are these proprietary buffers or? Uh, I don't think so. No. Yeah. There are, I think it's been published. They're not proprietary, but definitely in a little bit of uh, so where are they experience. So, where are the extraction? And they're just basically grinding it up in buffer A yes. and then adding buffer B. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, what would you estimate the cost of testing an individual sample with that? Oh, well, the cost is always tricky to estimate. It all depends on different variables, how established lab you are, how, what are the facilities, how, how much is the overhead. Uh, but yeah, uh, this method, as I said, there is no commercial kits are involved. There is no high quality of DNA that we are extracting with using those commercial kits. It's always a cost uh, intensive process. Uh, we have, based on our experience in, in, in our lab, uh, we compared this method with isolating uh, uh, high quality uh, nucleic acids using kits. Uh, we haven't uh, had major differences. We are always successful in detecting the virus. And definitely for red blotch, I would also mention that uh, uh, it is given us a little bit of trouble in terms of detecting uh, using only one set of primers. Uh, and probably it's also seasonal too. Uh, probably virus concentration is uh, varies different with a different uh, time of the season. So that's why we always employ, uh, use two sets of primers that are uh, specific to two different regions of the genome. And we establish that protocol and we always use those two sets to see, confirm the red blood virus. We've got time for one more question already. Can I just clarify Scott's question about the rooting ability? That's not all viruses cause that, right? It's we have information only for leaf rolls. That's what we did. Uh, so that's two, isn't that? that leaf roll two, yeah. Because leaf rolls two is always uh, uh, occur in natural population as different variants. There are six different classes of uh, variants, and one of them has uh, this rooting ability problem. Whereas leaf roll one or three is the most common one here. There are only a few that are here. Leaf roll two in Ontario. Right. Yeah, well, it depends on the region which the leaf roll two is very specific. In some regions, they have a lot of issues. And some other regions, most of, most of the other regions, are leaf roll three is the major uh, one that is. Well, please join me in thanking Sid for a really great uh, uh, talk today and a small token of our appreciation oh, that's that's not a, a quirk that's a usb key oh, right. <laughs> so don't throw that away yeah um and i'd just like to uh, make mention that next week uh please join us on wednesday for a regular lecture time at uh, two o'clock where jim Wilworth will be speaking about um, the impact of our changing climate on grapevine dormancy and cold hardiness thank you